How do you measure the cost of war? Lives, money, resources? Can a spreadsheet of data truly tell you the cost of waging a war on a people? The invention of photography promised to change much of what the world felt about war, as for the first time, the people at home saw the horrors of the battlefield without having to hear second-hand accounts when their sons, husbands, and fathers returned. However, while it may seem cold to say so, the images of destruction rained down upon mankind's achievements have often had a lot more of an impact on society than many of the deaths that come from war. To lose a loved one in battle is a personal tragedy, but to lose a cultural symbol, a proud monument to your history and nation, well, that can devastate an entire generation. In today's episode, we are going to examine some of the great creations of the Axis powers and the consequences of their mad drive for conquest. This is what the Second World War cost the losers in images. Welcome to Wars of the World. Sitting on the banks of the River Elbe in eastern Germany is the city of Dresden, the capital city of the German state of Saxony and the fourth largest city by area in Germany. Dresden itself is a fairly young city compared to some of Europe's more well-known metropolises, such as Berlin, London or Paris, although evidence of scattered settlements in the area go back as far as 7500 BC. The city played a key role in Saxony's history as an independent state and as a member of the German Empire after 1871. But following the Second World War, its name will forever be associated with the events of February 13th, 1945. By that time, the jaws of death were rapidly tightening around Nazi Germany's neck. Hitler's last great offensive in the West, known forever after as the Battle of the Bulge, ended in failure. While in the east, Stalin's Red Army were bleeding the German army to death. Meanwhile, the skies over Germany were so full of Allied aircraft that the German Luftwaffe couldn't even train replacement pilots without them being attacked by swarms of American or British fighters. Against this backdrop, the three big leaders, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin, met in Yalta on February 4th to discuss the handling of the end of the war. With his forces about to charge across eastern Germany towards Berlin, Stalin demanded that his western allies continue their bombing campaign against cities in the east to soften up resistance to the Red Army. The Americans and British had conducted a successful and devastating bombing campaign against Germany and so were well equipped for the task when Dresden was selected for a concentrated attack in support of the Soviet advance. However, there was some hesitancy among the Allied leaders. Firstly, the city's defenses had been sapped by Hitler himself in order to protect Berlin, and so was a comparatively weak target for capture. Secondly, stories of atrocities carried out by the Red Army against German civilians had sent thousands of refugees fleeing from the eastern border, with many of them seeking shelter in Dresden. A massive aerial assault against the city would therefore kill thousands. But Stalin had to be tempered, and so, on the night of February 13th, 1945, the attack began with RAF Bomber Command, sending over 800 Lancasters and Halifaxes against the city. Combined, they dropped 1,400 tons of high-explosive bombs and a further 1,100 tons of incendiaries, starting unnaturally hot fires. The next day, US bombers began their campaign against the city, with another massive raid taking place on February 15th. Given how little effort was made to record the number of refugees seeking shelter in the city, it has long been open to speculation just how many died in the attack. Figures have varied wildly from 8,000 to nearly a quarter of a million, but in 2010, an official number was published by the city's authorities 
putting the figure at around 25,000. What is certain, however, is that much of the city's beautiful and historic architecture was obliterated in the bombings, and with it, a great deal of German culture and history. Even in the UK and US, the bombing remains a topic of contention, with many arguing that it constituted a war crime. During the First World War, Germany's railway network was vital in keeping the German war machine equipped and mobile, transporting weapons and equipment to the front lines, while quickly redeploying troops during the many offensives or evacuating casualties in need of medical treatment. As such, German rail traffic increased dramatically during the war, and to compensate, Germany undertook a massive railway construction program, laying thousands of miles of new track to make the network as flexible as possible. Plans for a new bridge to be built over the Rhine, near the town of Reimagen, were drawn up as early as 1912, but with the demands of the war, famed German general Erich Ludendorff emphasized the need for construction to be accelerated, as it would connect three major railways in the area. As a result, the bridge that would eventually emerge bore his name. Measuring 325 meters in length, and with two piers protruding into the Rhine, the bridge accommodated two railway tracks to allow traffic to move in both directions across the river. As an alternative, the tracks could be covered with a wooden surface that would allow road traffic to use the bridge as well. With most of Germany's able-bodied men off at the front lines, much of the work was undertaken by predominantly Russian prisoners. Being a military undertaking, the bridge was designed with fortifications on either side and could accommodate a battalion of troops to guard it. Another feature not often found on regular bridges was the inclusion of positions for explosives at key structural points in order to destroy it so as to prevent an enemy force from using it to cross the Rhine and storm into Germany. And that was exactly the situation Germany found itself in during March of 1945. As part of Operation Lumberjack, the US Army's 9th Armored Division reached the bridge on March 7th. Allied commanders had anticipated that the Germans would have destroyed the bridge by now, and so were surprised to see it still standing as they reached the bank of the river. It seemed that the Germans had indeed attempted to destroy the bridge, but the charges they had used proved ineffective, and so both sides became locked in a bloody battle for control of the vital structure. One wanting to destroy it, the other wanting to use it to speed up the end of the war. At the same time, American combat engineers faced extraordinary danger as they climbed the sides of the bridge, removing the explosives laid by the Germans. Having saved the bridge from destruction, US forces held it for 10 days in the face of intense German fire. Even the dead-on-its-feet Luftwaffe launched attacks on the bridge in an effort to destroy it. Eventually, on March 17, 1945, the bridge could take no more and collapsed, killing 28 US Army engineers who were working on it at the time. By then, however, almost six whole divisions had used it to cross the Rhine, and furthermore, the Allies had established a pontoon bridge nearby, meaning that its collapse ultimately did little to halt the Allied advance. After the rubble was cleared away, only the two piers that had supported the bridge remained, standing as testaments to what had once been However, even these had to be removed in 1976, as they presented a hazard to river traffic. Dams have been built for many reasons, such as providing water for domestic and industrial use, or for driving hydroelectric power stations, and so are a key component of a nation's national infrastructure. For Germany, one of the most important industrial regions powering its economy was the Ruhr Valley, and as Germany experienced its boom period in the early 20th century, an ambitious construction program was undertaken, covering five dams at key strategic locations to support its manufacturing and mining industries. Of these new dams, the Muna was the most important, being situated near Dortmund, with its role being to collect rainwater and prevent any flooding of the valley. It also provided water for industrial and domestic use, and in turn, generated most of the hydroelectricity for the Ruhr Valley. 
This impressive feat of engineering was built of limestone rubble masonry and was protected against seepage by a clay bank. It stood at 112 feet high, with a base thickness of 130 feet, taping off to 25 feet at the top. It was 2,100 feet long, and when it was at full capacity, could hold back 135 million cubic meters of water, which flooded an area of 3,229 acres. Such was the importance of these dams to Germany, that even before the outbreak of the war, RAF Bomber Command were investigating ways to destroy them. It was no easy task, however. The sheer size and strength of their construction meant heavy bombs would be needed and delivered with accuracy that just wasn't available to medium or high-level bombers of the day. Low-level bombing stood more of a chance, but the Germans had installed heavy anti-aircraft defenses around them. Another option was to drop torpedoes, usually employed to sink ships into the reservoir and slam them into the walls, but the Germans had already thought of this and employed torpedo nets stretched out across the artificial lake to trap and foul any such weapons. It was not until legendary engineer Barnes Wallace presented his plan to use a bouncing bomb against the dams that a real effort to destroy them gained traction. Wallace's weapon was spun in the bomb bay of the launch aircraft and then dropped from low level over the water, where it would bounce several times over obstacles such as torpedo nets before striking the dam. The spinning weapon would then impart itself on the dam wall and sink to its base, where a hydrostatic pistol detonated the warhead at the right depth. As well as the blast from the explosives, the displaced water added to the destruction, thanks to gases from the explosion creating a pulsing effect. On the night of May 16th, 1943, RAF Lancasters of number 617 Squadron, which had been specifically formed to deliver the weapons, attacked the German dams using the bouncing bombs. Both the Muna and Edesi dams were breached, causing catastrophic flooding to the Ruhr Valley, destroying or damaging numerous vital factories, as well as shutting several mines as they became flooded with water. Additionally, Despite eight aircraft being lost and over 53 men killed, the attack did much to raise morale amongst the British people and created a legend that permeates even today. Looking at the damage inflicted on the Muna Dam, it's clear to see that while mankind has been able to conquer nature with our constructions, we have not been able to suppress our own destructive traits. In the early quarter of the 20th century, Japan was quickly rising to prominence as the only Asian empire that could truly threaten the old imperial European powers. And yet much of its new economic and military power was tailored on Western influences. A typical example of this contrast of East and West was the Hiroshima Prefectural Commercial Exhibition Hall, a building that stood in stark contrast to much of the old Japanese city in which it was built in 1915. Designed by Czech architect Jan Letzel, the building incorporated a distinctive dome mounted atop a curved tower section at the front of the building, which saw use as an art gallery and education center. By the summer of 1945, Japan was being encircled by its enemies as the war it began in China, which led to the attack on Pearl Harbor, was brought to its doorstep. But the Japanese looked set to fight on for months yet, maybe even years. Thus, the Americans decided that in order to speed up the conclusion of the war, the Japanese needed a demonstration of the ultimate power it now possessed in the form of the atomic bomb. To demonstrate this seemingly godlike power, they selected the city of Hiroshima for destruction, the target area being the city center near the building designed by Letzel its name now changed to the Hiroshima Prefectural Industrial Promotion Hall. At 8.15 a.m. on the morning of August 6, 1945, the building sat under a clear sky, the people in and around its distinctive shape unaware of the horror that was about to fall upon them. The atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima by the crew of the B-29 Superfortress named Enola Gay exploded at a height of 600 meters, 160 meters southeast of the building. At the moment of detonation, the explosion applied a pressure of 35 tons per square meter on the ground below, 
causing a violent wind speed of 440 meters per second to lash outwards in every direction. The building was engulfed in flames by the powerful explosion and absorbing heat. Interestingly, because the impact of the explosion came almost overhead, the outer wall and steel dome were not completely destroyed. However, this was of little help to the people inside at the time, who died immediately, incinerated in the unnatural fire that completely engulfed the building in flesh vaporizing flame. Estimations vary, but between 70,000 and 126,000 people were killed, burned, disfigured, or poisoned from the bomb's components. As the fire subsided and images of the devastation were revealed to the rest of Japan and then the world, the distinctive domed shape of the building structure remained intact, standing as an eerie reminder of the city that no longer existed, the city that was the first in history to burn in a nuclear fire. Three days later, Hiroshima was joined by Nagasaki on the list of cities destroyed by atom bombs when the US used their second weapon. In the aftermath of the attack, many survivors in Hiroshima demanded that the carcass of the building be torn down, not wishing to be reminded of the horror of the atom bomb. However, as the image of the gutted building had become so synonymous with the attack, a contradictory train of thought emerged that called for it to be preserved as a memorial to those who had died, and in the end, it was the latter group that won the debate. Often referred to as the Genbaku, or A-Bomb Dome, it is now formally identified as the Hiroshima Peace Memorial, and aside from some very limited work to maintain its structure, remains as it was following the bombing on August 6, 1945. Preserved as a UNESCO heritage site, the building is a stark reminder of the cost of war.